Before we can talk about market failure, we need to understand what is really meant when we say market. Anybody have suggestions for a definition of markets? <coughs> it's a term we just throw out and assume that we all know, but. Where buyers and sellers meet. Okay, where, where buyers and sellers meet. Often defined in terms of the good being sold, but what's being traded is a market for a particular thing. It can also be defined geographically. Okay. Okay. So a discovery process is what we just heard earlier. Was there another? <coughs> so it can be something as complex as stock markets, as non-complex as garage sales. It's where buyers and sellers meet. Um, I like that. It can also be something like. Uh, yeah. If we think broadly about the term markets and the discovery process, a singles bar cat works as a possibility. Uh, if you were a Star Wars fan, you would recognize that. Markets are arrangements for making exchanges. It's just whatever, anytime that people are making arrangements to exchange, they're creating a market. And so when we say that markets fail, we need to think about, well, what kinds of failures are, happen when people are making these exchanges? And the normal response to markets is, well, let's use politics. These are two classic definitions of politics. Uh, Harold Laswell's who gets what, when, and how is still, I don't know if any of you are political science majors, but I bet you've read that one. Uh, and David Easton is one that also is sort of the held up as the definition of politics, the authoritative allocation of values for a society. So if markets are the uh, non-authoritative, non-centralized uh, allocation of values, things that people value, then politics is done with authority. It's and. The standard assumption is that when markets fail, governments can make things better. Um, one thing for us to remember about politics is that as opposed to in the market where you're choosing for yourself, in politics you're choosing with others and for others because whatever you decide as a politician or as a bureaucrat is going to uh, affect other people. So. Um, and politics, another way to think about politics is, you know, we have the public square, the idea that we get from Aristotle of, of the citizens going down to the public square. Now the citizens were uh, people who could afford to. None of them were female. Uh, they had slaves and, and other people in their household to take care of all their household chores, so they were free. They were free from day-to-day -day worries and so they could go down to the polis, to the market place of politics to make political exchanges. And this is, you know, the most crass version of what politics is. Um, a purely non-romantic version, vision of politics. So, how is it that these exchanges fail? Well, one is that the, we don't produce enough public goods, and I'll define public goods for you in a minute, so don't worry about that. Uh, markets don't control negative externalities sufficiently. Negative externalities. Um, Externality in the economics literature refers to the unintended consequences of an exchange. So you and I make an exchange and somehow it creates a cost for Brooke that she didn't ask to pay, and it just somehow gets imposed on her. So it's the external costs of our actions, the spillover costs that happen because of whatever arrangement you and I make. 
so markets overproduce externalities, underproduce positive externalities or public goods. Again, we'll talk about those in a minute. That we end up with monopoly power. We end up with there are all kinds of principal agent problems in markets where the agents acting for the principals are acting in ways that not necessarily the principals would want. This is a problem in the firm. This is a problem in any organization, and that's that you have people at one level not carrying out the things that the person, uh, or the people at this level would like them to. And so then you have all kinds of ways of trying to figure out how do you solve principal agent problems. It's um, if you get insurance on your car, then are you less likely to be careful with your car than you were before you had insurance? Uh, there, there, it's all kinds of the, these kinds of supposed problems. And then there are information asymmetries. We may make a trade, and you may be purchasing something from me, but I know far about, more about what you're purchasing than you do. A used car, for example. Um, so I'm able to take advantage of you because I have superior information. Yes. So those, those are the standard kinds of uh, things that people worry about with markets. So th this little table tells us about the kinds of goods that are produced in markets. And so think about goods being defined by their provision and their consumption. Um, so if I, when I say that provision is rivalrous, I means you get it and Eduardo doesn't. And consumption by the individual is, again, I get it and you don't. So it's, con it's provided for me, it's consumed by me. That's a private good. What if it's provided for everyone and everybody gets to consume it? Then it becomes a public good. And actually, the, defi the real definition of a public good is that um, my consumption doesn't affect your consumption. So it's a good where it's provided. We, we cannot, cannot exclude anyone. And um, my consumption doesn't affect your consumption. Now, the standard examples given in almost every textbook is a lighthouse. You have an article about that that discusses the problems with that particular example. Uh, national defense is considered to be sort of the best example of a public good. We all get the benefits or costs of national defense. We're all consuming that benefit or cost, and my consumption doesn't affect yours at all. If we had these fluorescent tubes on in here, then we would all be consuming the light, but your consumption doesn't affect mine at all. And if it's provided for one, it's provided for everyone in this group. So for this group, it would be a public good. Problem with public goods and private provision of them is if I provide it for one and everybody gets it, then why in the world would I provide it for anybody? Once, it's provi once I put it up, everybody gets it, so I can't sell it. One, uh, one example I read was one by Gordon Tullock. He said, would be like flying over a city in an airplane full of bread and dumping all the bread out as you fly over the city and then come around and knock on people's doors and ask them to pay for the bread that they consumed. Well, I didn't have any. <laughs> or it just showed up. I didn't ask for it. It was here and I ate it. It was mine, not yours. So I'm not paying you. Um, you can see that the idea that providing public goods it becomes really we shouldn't expect markets to do them very well. Now, some economists claim, oh, no, that means we have to use government. 
And George Stigler, one of the famous Chicago economists, said, <clears throat> well, that response is like saying, we're, we're, we're judges at a singing contest, and we heard the first singer, and she was so awful that we award the, the prize to the second singer without even hearing her. It's kind of like giving a Nobel Prize to a president who has done nothing. <laughs> at the time, he had done nothing. Uh, he says facetiously. Um, but if we think about it seriously, there are very, very few goods that are public goods. Most of the things that we think of as public goods fall into those other two categories. They're either, either toll goods or they're common pool resources or they're in the commons. Now, a toll good, we're so used to toll goods now that we don't even think about them. Any of you go camping at a national forest campground? First thing you see as you go in, you see the sign, right? That says it's a, this is a fee area. And you pay your fee. And you enjoy the campground and you enjoy the hiking around it. But you had to pay a toll to be able to use it, a fee. Um, toll roads, hot lanes, where you, if you are driving in that lane, you're going to get charged for be using that lane. And the, the price can vary depending on the amount of congestion, the time of day. Uh, those are all examples of toll goods, and all of them are things that private people can provide. Um, if we go this other direction and find things where the group is able to consume, but their consumption rivals my consumption. The standard story for the commons is, is Garrett Hardin's article, 1968 article, called The Tragedy of the Commons. He tells a parable. All of us have cows that we graze in a common pasture. And uh, you can't stop me from adding any extra cows, and I can't stop you. So my mother-in-law dies and leaves me a cow. So what are we to do with our cow? Well, we can, one thing we could do is kill a cow and have a party, not because she died, but because we have all this extra meat. So, <laughs> um, or we can add the cow to the commons. And it's not a problem, adding the cow to the commons. Not a problem at all until we've reached the carrying capacity of that commons. That means that adding an extra cow means more gets eaten than grows. And as soon as I add an extra cow, I get how much of the benefit of the extra cow? All of it. And all the rest of you get the cost. So I get, if there, if there were 30 of us, I would get 1 30th of the cost and all the benefit. And the logic then is you should all add cows too when you can. Each of us acting in our short-term interest makes everybody else worse off in the long run, and the, the commons is destroyed. And Hardin says the tragedy is that our self-interest leads us to, produce, to do something that none of us want in the long run. Well, what do we do about the commons? Are there ways to control access to common pool resources? Sure are. <clears throat> in Switzerland, they have common pastures that have been operating for 400 years. And they're not being overgrazed because there are rules that are created and enforced by the local village that controls that pasture. Every spring, the cows go up into the common pasture. There, is, there are some herders who are hired not only to herd the cows, but to milk the cows and then make the cheese. Sounds like a really awful summer to me. 
milking cows and making cheese. I don't care how pretty this, the scenery is. <laughs> but there are people who do that. So everybody in, in the village pays to have the, the cows uh, herded, milked, and cheese made. And if you're not willing to pay, your cows don't go up there. It's pretty simple. Converted a commons into a, from an open access commons to a managed commons. And that's how you solve the commons problem, is you find some means of management. Uh, when the first cattle drives arrived in, uh, in Montana, there were lots of cows in Texas. After the, after the Civil War, people would started rounding up all of these cows, these stray cows, and the ones that they had on their ranches, and driving them north to the rails to be shipped to Chicago to be turned into whatever it is they do in slaughterhouses. Uh, but also, some of them went right on by and went to Montana because they'd heard there were these great grazing lands. And so they'd arrive, they arrive in Montana, and, and eastern Montana is ugly. I'm sorry if you're from Montana, but eastern Montana is ugly. In the sense that it's, there are almost no trees. The only trees are where you have these streams that come down through a valley. And so you have this, you, you will have, there's enough water for the tr trees to grow. And then all of these, these kind of rolling hills are covered with grass. And it's great for cows. As long as you have a way of them getting back to the water. So the first herd shows up and says, oh, this is a great little valley. I'll put my home ranch right here, headquarters here. We'll graze all the cows. The next one shows up and says, and the first guy says, hey, move over to the next valley because we're using all of this. And they did. And they kept doing that until basically all of that area had been used by the cows. Well, they didn't have fences. It was this commons. How do you keep your cows from my cows? How do, you keep, how do I keep your cows from coming over and eating my cow's grass? Without fences. Well, they invented fences. They, they were called cowboys <laughs> who rode the ridges. They built a line. A line shack at one end and a line shack at the other end, and they rode the ridge, pushing cows back. Uh, so the guy at this ranch would provide a cowboy, the one at this ranch would provide a cowboy, and they'd solve the problem with these human moving fences. Later, when barbed wire was created, you didn't have to have those cowboys anymore because you can put up, you can string barbed wire really easily, and you don't have to have those those cowboys anymore. But one of the really fascinating systems that arose among these. Uh, cowboys, these ranches, is they would have a roundup every spring. This is before the barbed wire. And you know, you, they, they have missed cows. There have been cows that have sneaked over from one side to the other and that got missed. Um, and you want to get clear up and push all of the cows down out of every little place where they've been hiding and hanging out. And they're ornery, by the way. These are not today's Herefords or Angus that stand around and say, kill me <laughs> so that you can eat me. Uh, th these, were, these are mean. So it's hard work. You bring all of the cows down to a central place where each calf gets branded with the brand that's on the cow that it's following. Unless, of course, that ranch didn't send any cowboys. Then it got branded by, with what the brand of one of the ranches that did bring cowboys. <laughs> and by the way, notice, brands. It's a way of identifying whose cow is whose. It's a way of identifying a property right. So take something that you would normally think of as being in the commons and put a brand on it, and now it's yours. It's, it's clearly private property. So there was this huge incentive for each ranch to provide sufficient cowboys to push the, all of the cows out and participate in this common communal activity. And that's where they, 
you know, they would have horse riding contests and roping contests, and uh, it was a big party. By the way, when you want to get people to work together, parties are a good way to get them to come. Uh, so this was a system that developed long before there was any law, formal law that arrived on the frontier. It was a system of managing cows in a commons, and once the formal law showed up, they recognized it as being a system that, uh, uh, this informal system as being appropriate and formalized it. Um, well, what about water? Water's a problem, isn't it? What happened in the West when, uh, in order to deal, to turn water from being a common pool resource into a private resource, is that uh, this is what happened in the mining camps. In the mining camps, the first person there would divert water out of a stream into his sluice boxes. And by the way, if you, the, the, the things they did with water, these huge, creating hydraulic pressure in these hoses so they were just wiping off mountainsides, uh, it's amazing stuff. But so the first person to divert the water had the senior right. The second person downstream had a junior right, and the third, the fourth, the fifth. But these rights were all based on how much water was in the stream, how much the first person had diverted, that was his right. Um, if he didn't use it, it came back and left it in the stream. People further down could use it. But it became this system of really clear private rights to something we think of as a common pool resource. Uh, formal law shows up and it all gets codified into a system of water rights and when I next talk about environmental things we'll talk about how that system of water rights makes it possible to protect fish, etc. Uh, all kinds of biotic resources. But the, idea, the standard approach is that bottom row, a commons we have to use the government. Public goods, we have to use the government. People are really creative and have figured out lots of ways of solving those kinds of problems. Uh, one of the things I had on the list was externalities. Uh, how do you solve externality problems? Uh, blank slide. I'll run through this slide anyway. We recognize that markets fail to be perfect. And if, you, if you're an MIT economist, you say, choose government. If you're a Chicago economist, you say, well, but government fails too, so you should choose markets. If you go to George Mason, they both say, look, markets aren't perfect. They're a process, a discovery process of people trying to, buyers and sellers trying to come together, and there's gonna be a lot of messiness in that system. They're not perfect, but governments fail as well, so we shouldn't assume that government is, is going to make things any better necessarily, and they say, choose markets. One of the things that uh, I think is important to note is that anytime there is anything we might call a market failure, it's an opportunity for an entrepreneur. How do I, here, here's a problem. How can I solve it? What can I do to recognize new opportunities? And one thing, by the way, to recognize in markets is that <clears throat> they're not static. So Schumpeter, talked about markets as being faced with this perennial gale of destruction. You know, my father no longer dominates the plastic ski market. Doesn't come close because there are other competitors who have been, who recognized, ooh, this is an interesting market and we can do a better ski than that old Simmons guy can and here are some ways we're gonna do, make it better. And I mean, he does have a patent uh, and they 
but they figured out ways to do a plastic ski that didn't infringe on his patent, and they are making skis that sell better than his. Um, so he has to, he's facing this sort of churn that happens in markets. Um, Israel Kirshner said that entrepreneurs are people who are alert to unrecognized opportunities. Uh, you know, and I put up Steve Jobs because he's one of the best people that in the last two decades, three decades, he's recognized new opportunities. But entrepreneurs can step into commons problems and fix them. Again, when we do the environment stuff later, I'm going to talk about that. One of the problems we need to recognize is that government failure is a real opportunity for entrepreneurship as well. Uh, and I put up bootleggers and Baptists here because <clears throat> this is a story told by Bruce Yandel, an economist at Clemson. Who's, he's now retired, but uh, if you ever get a chance to hear Bruce talk, do it. He's just, he's amazing. I used to do a, uh, he and I used to do two days of lectures each at lunch on Capitol Hill with Capitol Hill staffers. I always wanted to be the first two days because nobody can compare with Bruce, so you don't want to try and follow him. But he said, there's this interesting thing that happens with regulation. We get coalitions of people who are really unlikely to like each other. It's as if they were bootleggers and Baptists getting together. Now, bootleggers are those who make illegal alcohol in the South. There's a market for their illegal alcohol because many southern counties are by law, dry. You can't sell any alcohol in those counties. Others have, there are dr they are dry on Sundays. So you either stock up or you buy from your neighborhood bootlegger. Well, the Baptists are always upset about people drinking, the idea that people are going to drink, and the fact that people are drinking. So they want to really enforce these laws. So anytime some legislator says, Let's make this county a wet county. Let's just forget this silliness. The Baptists get all upset. They carry the moral banner. The bootleggers provide the cash <laughs> to support the campaign to keep it a dry county. Because the bootleggers only exist because of dryness. <laughs> now what can happen in politics is you can get lots and lots of people com combining in the same kind of way, doing all kinds of interesting entrepreneurship, which is a way of saying, don't expect that government actions to fix supposed market failures are going to be actually make things better because there's such great, there are so many great political entrepreneurs out there. And I think one of the best examples to talk about, um, you don't have anybody talking about the financial crisis, do you? viewed broadly as being a huge market failure. Um, a way of thinking about not just the financial crisis, but uh, government responses to market failures in general, is to refer back to Genesis chapter 29, the story of Rachel and Leah. So Jacob gets old enough to marry, and he wants to, goes off to find a wife. And the wife, he discovers, is his cousin. They did that then. Um, and he goes to, and he meets Rachel, and he goes to Rachel's father and said, I'd like to marry her. He says, oh, sure, you can marry her. You just have to work for me for seven years. And he does. He works for him for seven years. They have the wedding. No, she's wearing the veil. They go in the tent. It's dark. Consummate the marriage. In the morning, a little light seeps in, and he looks. And it's not Rachel. It's her sister, Leah. And he goes to Laban and says, hey, wrong daughter. And Laban said, sorry. The oldest daughter has to marry first. But if you want to marry Rachel, you can stay for another seven years. Um, Rachel must have been pretty impressive. Uh, <clears throat> one political scientist, uh, Aaron Vodovsky, 
used this example and said, you know what happened is that America fell in love with the Rachel of social reform. You might think of the Rachel of solving, government, solving uh, market failures. And woke up in the morning with the Leah of big government. And that's essentially what ha happens every time there is an attempt to fix a supposed market failure. Now, one of the, the example I wanted to, to use for the rest of the time is to talk about the financial crisis. Look at that graph. Instability is normal. It's what happens. And the idea that we can fix something that's normal is kind of interesting. Um, one reason for instability is just the creative destruction of new people recognizing new opportunities. Uh, and by the way, the claim that greed is good is kind of silly. Greed just is. People are motivated by out of their self-interest, and sometimes they're greedy. And to say that it's good is, is, is like saying, oh, I have feet, that's good. Uh, what you want to do is devise institutions that take advantage of people's self-interest rather than just crying about the fact that they might be self-interested. But, you know, one problem is that the most, I think one of the most important causes of the, of the modern business cycle is not necessarily just the competition. People recognizing new opportunities, people making mistakes. And that's the great thing about markets. They let you make mistakes and then they make you pay. Um, is politics. And part of the problem of the politics is that politicians tend to be economically ignorant and they tend to think they know more than the rest of us. Hayek called uh, the idea that people, that we can fix governments, I mean that we can fix markets through government is a pretty fatal conceit. It's a conceit in the sense that we think we know better than all those people out there in those markets. It can be fatal in the sense that it can completely destroy things. Um, and then the other is rent seeking. We had somebody in the group earlier want to know what that word uh, phrase is. Uh, there it is, rent seeking. And one of the best examples during the financial crisis was Goldman Sachs who managed to get all kinds of special benefits provided to them out of the, uh, out of the bailout. Uh, so seeking favors from government is a way of creating instability. Now, when you have cycles, and we, all, we do have cycles, where we boom and we bust and we boom and we bust, the trick is that the, to try and keep the booms from getting too large, the bust from getting too, uh, too deep. And politicians use two different tools. They have two tools that they can use. One is monetary. You just manipulate the money supply and interest rates. And you can control the economy that way. The other is fiscal, where you ma manipulate tax and spending policy. So you increase or reduce taxes, you spend more money, you, 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 don't, you spend less money. These are supposed to be ways of controlling these uh, cycles that are all, often called market failures. So here's what happens. We have this problem and uh, aggregate demand from uh, drops, and so what we want to do is lower interest rates and increase the money supply 
so that we'll push this back out here. During an upturn, because it's going, this gets pushed out too far, we want to increase interest rates and reduce the money supply to pull it back. So we're doing away with the, uh, the cycles. And the idea is, well, it's kind of like steering a ship. People sit in the White House and they <coughs> decide, or in Congress, and say, let's spend more money, let's spend less money, or let's increase the money supply, decrease the money supply, affect interest rates, and we can keep this ship going in a pretty straight line. Now, this morning we heard about people thinking that economics is essentially engineering. This is another example of that. The idea that we, can, we think we can, that it's like steering a ship. Again, this is a fatal conceit. Um, to steer that particular ship means that you know things that nobody else can know. Uh, you need to have power that's just really not available to you. And neither governments or, poli or ec economists know everything. I know, you've met economists who think they do. And they t they're almost always macroeconomists. Um, and there are very good macroeconomists out there, as long as they live within their model, it's inside their computer, and don't try and apply it to the real world. Uh, so let me give you some examples. One is the idea from the Obama administration. We have all of these shovel-ready projects we can, go we can go put money into, and we are going to create all this employment, and the money for the, we, that those people get paid then goes into the economy and multiplies, and pretty soon the world's a happy place. So I was mayor at this time and thought, interesting, shovel-ready. We had a three-mile road segment that had been on the books for at least 10 years, the previous five years of rather intensive planning. It takes that long to do the environmental impact statement and then to do an environmental assessment after that if, if, if necessary to hold all of the public hearings to get all of your engineering done and now fit the engineering into what the environmental impact statement said. Five years, a minimum of five years for this piece of road. Well, it turns out we'd done that. We were shovel ready. Well, it also turns out we had the money already. We'd been planning it for this long time. The money was there. It was actually there in the county, not within the city, part of a county tr uh, regional transportation fund. And so what happened is we took the federal money and built the section of road. The money we would have spent now stays in this county pool and will be again, it will be spent eventually on some new road in some other city. No net spending increase at all because of, to, to fix, to fund this shovel-ready project. Um, I don't think that's atypical at all. If there were shovel-ready projects, almost all of them would have already had the funding in place. So when, when you had people talking shovel-ready, they truly just didn't understand the process necessary in order to build new things. Um, so we will be spending money in my county sometime in the next 10 years to get us out of the 2008 recession. Uh, there are just amazing time lags. Um, Milton Friedman said this idea of trying to steer a ship is like assuming that you have this big rubber band that's attached to the steering system in the boat that goes back to the rudder and you turn it 
and it stretches the rubber band a little bit, but not enough to turn the rudder. And you turn it some more, and it stretches it a little bit more, but still not enough to turn the rudder. And you, and you turn it some more until you finally start getting some reaction. But by then, that rubber band is really tight, and it might pull you back too far. And so now you've been pulled too far in the opposite direction. And it just becomes an impossibility to know how much or how little to know actually what the effects are going to be. Because people are just, people just don't do what politicians say. My grandfather, I think, put it best. He said, people are just no damn good. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's wrong. I think people are great. But uh, they, in, in the sense of doing what politicians want, they just don't do it. Um, in, towards the end of the last Bush administration. He wanted to pump up the economy because we were heading, things were really slowing down, so he did this tax rebate. And so people got checks, checks right to their checking accounts. Two thirds of that money went to pay off debt. Some of it went into savings. Some small fraction actually went into the economy where it might spur more economic growth, but nearly nothing. So this policy that was supposed to pump up the economy did nothing for the economy. People just wouldn't spend their money. I mean, he went on TV and said, go to Disneyland. Take vacations. It's good for the economy. Um, And when I say that governments are uninformed about all this stuff, I'm not pointing a finger and saying those stupid people. They're really smart people. The economists that Obama had around him at the beginning of his administration were some of the best in the country. They're just really, really good. I think that's why they've all quit. But uh, um, we don't have theories that can tell us really what's going on in an economy. We don't have, information's unclear, it's outdated. By the time information gets to us, events have moved on. Uh, we don't know how, how strong this particular shock is going, in the economy is going to be. So we don't know, should we do a lot? Should we do a little? Uh, we don't even know what the effects are going to be of, of uh, a, a particular intervention. <laughs> I mean, the Fed's been trying to dump money into the economy for years now. There's money sitting there to be loaned, but in this world, in this climate, who's willing to take a chance and take a loan? There's no demand for loans, even though there's plenty of money for loans. Um, well, I say people refuse to act like the economists want them to. We don't know how much taxing and spending is enough. We don't know how much new money we need. We don't know what the right interest rates are. Frankly, macroeconomists need to become a lot less sure of themselves. Um, more humility. Um, politicians, however, recognize a lot of this, so they, we like to use smoke and mirrors. Now, I, I thought of taking this slide out, but because I, I don't know how much to believe it. But I do believe it some, so I left it here. A stable economy doesn't benefit a politician and it doesn't benefit a bureaucrat. Politicians are wanted when there are problems. Bureaucrats are wanted when there are problems. So even though we might all be better off if things are stable, know that there's not a, an incentive for politicians and bureaucrats to cause things to be stable, even if they could. But um, we become more important. We have more money to spend. We get more ego rewards if the economy is working poorly, because we can claim all these great things we've done. Yeah, shouldn't any stability in politics benefits neither politician or bureaucrat unless they can take that's a, uh, yeah, exactly. Unless they could take credit for it, I would be happier with that line. 
than the one I have up there. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Instability can mean we can ask for higher budgets because we have to fix this problem. It's politicians. Th this was in uh, the in the Reagan administration. I worked in the Reagan administration in the Department of the Interior in the early '80s, uh, and the Laffer curve was a big deal to conservatives. He said, "Look, we have this tax rate, and if." Um, we're taxing at this amount, we're going to get this much revenue. And if we tax at that high amount, we're going to get this much revenue because people are going to change their behavior. They're not going to work as hard. So there's, you can have the high tax rate, but they're not going, you're not just, just not going to have as much money to, to tax. So there is this curve that we, and so we have to figure out what's the optimal tax. Well, if we want more revenue, the optimal tax is out here at M. So let's tax here. Who knows what that point is? Nobody. It's like trying to say, well, there's a social welfare function. Really? How do we know? How do we add up individuals' welfare functions into something that we call a social welfare function? You can't do it. It, doesn't, it just doesn't happen. And this, there, there are some important things to think. That what, what the Laffer curve taught us is that the world's not stable. People will respond to, tax, different, to different tax rates. Individual people will respond in different ways. So if you try and overtax, you are going to get less money. But we don't know how much overtax means. We don't know what the uh, optimal amount means. Uh, we truly don't know. Uh, but it sounded good. What it sounded like is, hey, we can reduce taxes clear down to here, and we'll still have the same amount of money. So tax cuts will pay for themselves. That was said in the Reagan administration. It was said in both Bush administrations. Um, not sure. Don't remember any statement, any statements like that in the Clinton administration. Uh, Clintons were too worried about other things. This is another thing that conservatives likes to say. Well, let's just starve the beast. Continue spending, but don't increase taxes. And you finally will get to a point where we'll say, oh no, we've grown this thing so big, it's got to die. So uh, the idea, Alan Greenspan said, said this, uh, trust that there's a political limit to deficit spending. So just keep deficit spending, and boom, something will happen. You'll be able to cut everything back. One of the things that they didn't count on in making those claims is that it's one committee in Congress makes taxing decisions, and another committee in Congress makes spending decisions. It's like the really dysfunctional marriage where one spouse uh, makes the money and another spouse spends the money and they don't talk to each other? Well, that's in some ways the way Congress functions. And so say you're going to starve the beast, that doesn't affect the spending side at all. Yeah, you have, com you have committee chairs, you have leadership who are trying to bring things in and, and control it some, and they do, but still uh, starve the beast all of the data show that Starve the Beast has led to higher spending in the short run and the long run, uh, contrary to the hope that it would lead to higher spending in the short run, but less spending in the long run. I'm not advocating the strategy. I think it's flawed, but um, I don't understand how having separate uh, decision-making really uh, affects that. I mean, to go from the an analogy, you know, even if the man and woman are talking about the budget issues. Why did you assume it was a man and woman marriage? <laughs> <laughs> I can distinguish between them. OK. Difficult. All right. <laughs> OK. So the man is spending all the money, and the woman is making oh, the money. Oh, nice. The man is still going to run out of money to spend, even if they don't talk. 
Now, it may take too long for it to matter, and it may be a huge and ridiculous process, but, and I imagine it would be a lot quicker if they talked about it and agreed about it, but the whole reason why you'd have to start the beast in the first place is because people won't agree to mm -hmm. tax and debt cut spending. That is the, that's the logic behind Starve the Beast. It just has never worked yet. Maybe we haven't waited long enough. Bill Niskanen, who was one of the early proponents of this, uh, Niskanen was at the Cato Institute. Uh, what was, I don't remember his title, but he was on their board at least. But uh, he was an early proponent of it. Before he died, he said, I was wrong. It, uh, it hasn't had any real effect on long-term spending. Oh, the easy, yeah, the easy way out of starving the beast is just to in, is inflation. Yeah. So we haven't gotten there yet, but I did check on car loans the other day, and they've gone from, at the bank that I was asking, they've gone from 2.9 to 5 percent in the last three months. Um, I can't see how we're not going to have inflation, but that is a way out of, out of the star of the beast thing. What I'm suggesting in all of this is that <clears throat> when we think we can fix a market failure, we can provide public goods, we can make the world a better place, we need to figure out who the we are, and if we're doing it in, in, in terms of government, um, it's just primarily a way of feeling good. Uh, and it's, it's really quite arrogant. Yeah, I'm, I, I assume you may have read some Adam Smith. This is from the Theory of Moral Sentiments where he talks about a man of system is somebody who believes they f know how to make things work and out of their good intentions, they're going to make things work well. The man of system seems to imagine he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. Well, that was, that's the idea behind a lot of the policies that government uses to try and manipulate the economy, also to fix other problems that might occur out of ch exchanges. Smith goes on to say, people don't, people don't just get moved by that hand. They also get moved by their own. They have a motive power of their own, he says. And so they act, they don't spend the money that the, that the Bush administration gives them. They don't borrow the money that the Obama administration makes possible. Um, they don't act the way that we think they ought to. This is the, this is the slide that I told you about earlier, this morning about, uh, when I was a 17-year-old long-haired freak, I thought there was a war machine and a pig power structure. This is from, that's language from the 60s. Uh, believing in evil power is more reassuring than chaos. Even if, uh, it should be, even if someone's evil, at least someone is in, in control. Now that I'm a 47-year-old long-haired freak, I don't think there's any conspiracy. I don't think Bush wants to do Iraq just for oil. Sadly, I believe the bigger horror. He thinks he's doing the right thing. I think people are good, and that's worse. Believing people are doing what they think is best is infinitely sadder. I have met no one in government. I've worked in the federal government. I have worked in state and local government. I, I'm around them, them meaning politicians, all the time. I haven't met any who I think believe they're making the world a better place or that they, you know, they get up in the morning saying, how can I screw citizens today? They think they're doing good things, and they're trying to do good things. The problem is they don't have the information or the ability or the power to do those good things that, and, and have, actually have them turn out well. Um, it would be nice if politicians 
and all of us would develop a different thinking, think differently about markets than we normally do. And we think, oh no, markets fail. Well, if markets are failing all the time, then how come we have so much stuff? How come things go along so well? Why is the world improving? And I really do believe that the world is improving. Uh, <clears throat> I went to Poland soon after the Berlin Wall fell. And it was dreary. It was dark. It was dirty. The best cars were the East German Trebants. Uh, people didn't know if they owned their own apartments or not. They've been, you know, the state had been giving them these apartments. So now, do I have to pay for it? Do I have to pay rent to somebody? Who owns it? Do I own it? Does the guy who was here and went off to West, escape to West Germany 20 years ago and has now come back and is claiming my apartment, is, is, is it his? And you had to stand in line in food stores. You had to stand in line in all kinds of stores. It was, I was disturbed. I wanted to come home and grab my kids who were all teenagers at the time and go back so they could see it. But my first night home, uh, Janet and I needed to run down to the grocery store, and so we did. This is the grocery store. The name of it is Macy's. Um, and those are the mountains just behind my house. Uh, we pulled into the parking lot, and I parked, and I just sat there. I looked around, and Janet said, what's wrong? I said, look at this. These are all people who either own their cars, and they're nice cars, or they're paying for them. And they're going into a grocery store that's full of food. And if you go to the milk aisle, you have uh, whole milk and 2% and 1% and no fat and uh, almond milk and coconut milk and all kinds of cheeses, all of this stuff. It's a miracle. And she said, Randy, it's Macy's. Well, sorry, it's a miracle. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's Macy's. <laughs> But we, you know, we just stopped to realize how magic, what a wonder markets are. Uh, this is a line from uh, Russ Roberts. He says, you know, going to the grocery store for the hundredth or thousandth time is a pretty humdrum experience. It is. We forget to think how magic it is that I get mint Milano's wherever I go. How did they know I was coming? Uh, all of these uncoordinated actions, not coordinated by any politician, but uncoordinated actions produce Mint Milano's for me. I don't know what it produces for you, but it produces Mint Milano's for me. Uh, and these are strangers that we're dealing with. I'm making, strangers are taking care of me. Um, and when I see a supposed market failure and people say, well, we've got to fix it, my response is, well, most of the problems are beyond politics. They're beyond the ability of coordinated, centralized, concentrated power to fix. They might be something that clever entrepreneurs can fix. And that's what I'm going to talk about next when I talk about in the environment, is giving some examples of how that might work. Um, too many words, too many words, too many words. That's the important one. We need to stop demanding that politicians do things that they can't. Yeah, it's an easy thing to say. It requires a whole bunch of education. Uh, Barry Goldwater gave one of the greatest convention speeches ever. In it, he said, we don't, do not seek to lead anyone's life for him. We seek only to secure his rights and to guarantee him opportunity to strive. Find politicians who are willing to say that. Uh, they're pretty scarce today. Uh, so all kinds of things are claimed that government can do. 
I don't think it can fix government, I don't think it can fix market failures. And if we're looking for what we want government to do, I think that's the point. That's it.